It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Blair, a clinical associate professor of medicine at the University of Chicago. Today, we'll be discussing his Jack Interventions manuscript, investigating the association between coronary microvascular dysfunction and slow flow and angiography. Dr. Blair, thank you so much for taking the time to join us and share your expertise. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. It's great to be here. Um, first, can we start with a brief background about the topic, the questions that you aim to answer, and the population that was studied? Yeah, of course. So, uh, coronary blood flow and coronary function is uh, has become uh, kind of top of mind for a lot of interventionalists because um, it, it's kind of a frustrating group of patients who, um, in about, it turns out to be up to about two thirds of patients who come to the cath lab with good chest pain stories. Um, and, and, you know, testing showing ischemia, um, by the time they make it to the cath lab, two thirds of them end up having non-obstructive or, or no coronary artery disease seen on the coronary angiogram. And um, if you look deeper into these patients, the, these are patients that we now call INOCA patients, ischemia with non-obstructive mm -hmm. coronary disease. And if, if you look closely and get invasive studies, um, by measuring the coronary flow reserve or index of microvascular resistance, or if you do non-invasive studies like stress PAD or stress MRI, about half of these patients will have abnormalities in their coronary blood flow or in, in their coronary resistance. And these patients are, are, are generally termed as patients who have coronary microvascular dysfunction or mm -hmm. CMD. And uh, patients with CMD prognos prognostically have a worse prognosis uh, than patients who have uh, normal coronaries without CMD. And, um, but like I said, it becomes kind of a difficult diagnosis because you either have to have PET, stress on MRI, mm. or you have to have the tools and the expertise to measure the coronary function in, in the cath lab. So um, that, that caused some people and some um, uh, expert groups to recommend uh, that we could use a really old school way of measuring coronary blood flow. And that's by using the corrected Timmy frame count. Um, mm. And the reason I say it's an old school is because it's been around since the beginning of uh, angiography for uh, acute myocardial infarction. And it was a measurement of, essentially of the uh, surrogate for coronary blood flow. And mm. when you take a cine angiogram, uh, you wait for the contrast to get to the very tip of the artery in, of interest and you count the number of frames that it takes for the coronary uh, uh, coronary contrast to reach the tip of that coronary artery. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's called the Timmy frame count, and it's corrected for 30 frames per second and, and also for longer vessels and such. But uh, right. that concept is that if you have a high um, corrected Timmy frame count, that means your flow is slow, mm -hmm. and slow flow in the setting of an acute myocardial infarction means that you have microvascular obstruction and uh, that, that is causing the slow flow. So people have used that and, and taken that one step further and applied it, that mm. concept to patients who are more stable, who have INOCA. Mm. And uh, the Covatis um, group, for example, which is an expert consensus group, um, used coronary slow flow as one of the criteria to measure uh, coronary microvascular dysfunction for these patients, and it it does have its um, it does have its uh, advantages, being very easy to do, inexpensive, and, and the mm -hmm. same, uh, and, and not particularly requiring any expertise. You just inject contrast and measure the uh, the, uh, the the frames. Um, so the reason we what what we did is we wanted to challenge this notion of mm -hmm. using corrected Timmy frame count for these stable patients uh, and comparing it against known uh, standards of coronary blood flow and microvascular resistance. And okay. so our aim was to basically compare uh, corrected Timmy frame count and measurements of coronary slow flow on angiography to mm -hmm. invasive coronary function testing with CFR, IMR, and resting coronary blood flow. Okay. So, uh, that was the aim of the study, and uh, we sought to do this in uh, mostly a retrospective uh, registry at three different centers. 
Um, okay. And we can get into the details of that in a second. But yeah, 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 yeah. and uh, thank you. I think that's that's very important to kind of to set the table for for the next phase of of this. And and what was you know we briefly talked about the population, and and you mentioned that you know how many patients was it? All the patient had microvascular dysfunction. Can you tell us more about the population that was studied? Yeah, so we we did the study amongst three um, major centers that do a lot mm -hmm. of coronary function testing at University of Chicago, NYU, and uh, and South Lake in Toronto, and um, and these three centers have a lot of experience at doing coronary function testing and have clinics where they evaluate chest uh, chest pain patients and INOCA patients. Mm -hmm. So we selected the patients who have non-obstructive coronary disease and who are seen for angina who made it to the cardiac cath lab and underwent coronary angiography and then coronary function testing. Um, and then it was actually qu uh, quite a simple study. So we took mm. those, that kind of general broad, um, all comers type population with chest pain who underwent coronary function testing. And uh, we measured the corrected Timmy frame count, CFR, and mm -hmm. IMR in those patients. CFR is coronary flow reserve, which is basically the ratio of hyperemic blood flow to resting blood flow. A mm -hmm. high CFR is good. That means that they, the patient can augment their coronary blood flow uh, appropriately and uh, presumably because of normal microvascular function. And IMR is index of microvascular resistance. And it uses principles of flow and resistance to measure uh, an index for resistance and a high IMR implies high microvascular resistance. So we compared the corrected Timmy frame count with CFR and IMR in these patients um, and essentially did a simple correlation analysis. We looked at um, Timmy frame count as, as it re uh, relates to these two measurements. And then mm -hmm. we looked at Timmy frame count as it relates to combinations of normal and abnormal CFR and IMR in a two by two fashion. So kind of a, a slightly more complicated mm -hmm. uh, correlation analysis, just to make sure that uh, our findings were uh, robust. And then finally we did univariate, uh, multivariate, and, and then a receiver operator curve analysis to mm -hmm. then further uh, test um, our findings and, uh, and, and to see if there were any subgroups or any uh, particular um, subpopulations that may um, better predict um, abnormal microvascular function. Great. So that was essentially our, our study. And uh, we ended up studying 508 patients. Mm. Uh, like I said, they were all comers, and some of them ended up having microvascular dysfunction. Some of them did not. Um, mm -hmm. And we can get into the exact... Uh, you know, proportion of patients um, when we talk about our findings, but that's the, our general population and our general strategy for this uh, for this paper. Okay, yeah, thank you. And that's kind of, you know, touching base on how this represents real world. It's all comers and you just got to um, associating this low flow with, you know, normal, abnormal findings. And moving toward the results, can you share with us the, the findings of the analysis and, you know, the, and you kind of, we want, you went over the multiple analyses that you and the team performed? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the, the findings were that um, we, we had, we were able to perform coronary function testing in all 508 patients. Mm -hmm. So it was a very large study that comprised about 70% women and, uh, and, and, a typical chest pain population um, mm -hmm. beyond that. Risk factors such as diabetes, obesity, hypertension, those were there. And uh, when we looked at coronary slow flow, which was a dichotomous variable um, with a cutoff of 25 uh, cor corrected Timmy frame count, um, if you had a higher than 25 corrected Timmy frame count, that was um, defined as coronary flow, slow flow. It was about mm -hmm. half of all patients or 49% to be exact. Hmm. And um, so when you took the coronary slow flow patients versus uh, coronary normal flow, coronary mm -hmm. slow flow patients were more likely to have actually, so the hypothesis was uh, that we tested and, and the count challenge, uh, the, the thing that we are, the paradigm that we were challenging was um, does coronary slow flow correlate with coronary flow reserve? Mm -hmm. And we actually found the opposite. We found that coronary slow flow, which is bad, it shows that the resting flow is low, mm -hmm. um, 
is actually more likely to have a low, a, a high or, or good mm -hmm. or normal yeah. CFR. So mm -hmm. it's kind of the opposite um, mm -hmm. of finding. It, it makes sense when you kind of think about what exactly we're measuring, but mm -hmm. uh, ordinarily a finding that we would associate to be abnormal um, mm -hmm. with a high coronary uh, uh, or, or high uh, Timmy frame count or coronary slow flow was actually more likely to have a normal CFR. Mm -hmm. uh, but it did correlate with patients who had an abnormal IMR. These okay. correlations, uh, mind you, they were there. They were, um, you know, inverse and and, um, and and positive correlations, respectively. Um, they were there, but they were very weak correlations with an mm. R squared, uh, or actually an R, not even an R squared, 0 0.20 or, or okay. less. It mm. you know, wasn't very uh, uh, robust of a correlation, but the correlation was there. Um, so it was a weak correlation. Um, and then when you um, when you took in other multivariate uh, predictors that you would think would be associated with abnormal CFR or abnormal IMR, mm -hmm. the predictability of coronary slow flow for these things was even weaker. Mm -hmm. So when we tested this against sensitivity, specificity, and receiver operator characteristics, again, the area under the curve was less than 50% in a lot of cases, in a lot of comparisons. So a very weak correlation, very mm. weak predictability of using coronary slow flow as a marker. And, um, and, and then finally, um, uh, yeah, so, so that was, um, yeah, I think those were the main comparisons that we did. And because uh, I, I, I think we also mentioned the multivariate analysis. Right. Um, so, in other words, no matter which way we sliced it, mm. um, coronary slow flow using uh, corrected Timmy frame count uh, not only predicted uh, a high CFR, which was um, somewhat unexpected, um, but it, and, and but it uh, overall was a weak correlation. And the more you kind of looked at the receiver operator characteristics and multivariate analysis. Um, those the strength of those correlations um, kind of deteriorated the more mm. you look into it. Um, so that was, uh, um, I, I think the findings and, and the, the implications of this are, are, are mm -hmm. pretty interesting. I mean, um, first of all, the main takeaway here is that you can't really use the angiogram Although mm -hmm. as much as we like to use the angiogram for yeah. everything, yeah. you can't use the angiogram to determine uh, coronary flow reserve and in index of microvascular resistance. It's just mm -hmm. kind of comparing apples to oranges. Uh, mm -hmm. It's attractive. It, it probably works in the setting of acute myocardial infarction, but in mm -hmm. stable INOCA patients, you just mm -hmm. cannot use the angiogram and you have to dig deeper into your tool set and if you want to do it non-invasively, you have to do either PET, cardiac MRI, or mm -hmm. in some centers, um, Doppler echo. Um, mm -hmm. Or um, while you're at it, while you're doing the coronary angiogram, um, you can use um, you, you you can use a um, a wire to measure surrogates of flow and resistance, uh, like we did in the study, and we do uh, routinely for for coronary function testing. So you do. If you want to make those conclusions, you have mm. to take it uh, one step further to actually make the, the real measurements. Um, the other the other piece of it is that um, this all makes sense if you actually think about what you're measuring with corrected Timmy frame count. Mm. So corrected Timmy frame count just measures the um, a, a surrogate for blood flow um, at rest. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of stuff going on at rest, like resting blood flow is oftentimes determined not only by um, the um, microvasculature and epicardial um, coronary blood vessels, but also sympathetic tone, things like endothelium mm -hmm. and, and other things. And it's um, and, and the resting flow uh, can also vary with, with different types of physiologic um, stressors that can happen at, at baseline. Um, so measuring resting flow really doesn't tell you much about what's going on in the mm -hmm. microvasculature. If you really want to uh, measure the microvasculature, 
you have to fully dilate the precapillary arterioles to maximize the blood flow through your system to then measure the resistance and the flow reserve. Mm -hmm. So uh, they're somewhat related because the flow reserve is, is uh, the ratio of hyperemic flow to resting flow. So if resting flow is the de denominator, um, slow resting flow um, is, is going to... Um, it is going to actually increase your yeah. CFR for, for normal um, uh, hyperemic flow. So if you think of it that way, mm -hmm. um, you're going to find what we found, which is that um, coronary slow flow actually predicts normal CFR, which mm -hmm. is what we found. And, uh, and oftentimes coronary slow, slow, slow flow um, is associated with hypertension and, um, and, and, increase resistance and that's mm -hmm. also i believe why we found that um the presence of coronary slow flow um actually correlated more with index of microvascular resistance and uh yeah. you know there there are a lot of false positives and false negatives there but there's that general correlation mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. goes on there yeah um, and yeah <laughs> No, th thank you, Dr. Blair. And I think I think your your analysis in your paper is a beautiful example of a of an assumption that we keep doing in medicine, where we use some results and some conditions, and you know apply them to other conditions. And and your your analysis it's a beautiful example that you know that slow flow in AMI might not really apply in people with microvascular dysfunction in and in, in OCA. And these are kind of an, an important you know findings that we that we reach and. How do you think we move forward, especially, you know, in the topic of microvascular dysfunction in terms of, you know, maybe Doppler free um, parameters or, or in general, how do we how do we move forward? Yeah, I think uh, this is a good first step in recognizing that we can't just rely on, on the coronary angiogram or at mm -hmm. least uh, the way that we interpret coronary angiograms currently. Mm -hmm. uh, and this this uh, study was based on a, a, a few other studies uh, that were uh, smaller or used different mm -hmm. techniques, but it's part of a growing body of evidence um, showing that you cannot use a, uh, the, the resting coronary angiogram uh, to, to make the diagnosis. So mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of potential ways that we can go from this. Um, mm -hmm we can, there, there may be ways um, similar to the way we measure um, IFR or RFR or these other um, uh, resting indices where mm -hmm. we can use different parts of the cardiac cycle to, to measure um, the, the, the time and the, the contrast um, washout uh, during various phases in the cardiac cycle um, and, and use uh, kind of more in-depth analysis of the coronary angiogram to try to determine that. There's definitely some interest in uh, in trying to determine non-invasive uh, mm -hmm. coronary angiography-based CFR and IMR similar to the way uh, where you, th they did it with FFR and C2. Mm -hmm. So that's one potential direction. Um, other potential directions will be... Um, uh, um, I, I guess um, finding different ways to mm. uh, simplify the way we use this with either Doppler or thermodilution techniques. Um, mm. Currently, uh, the thermodilution technique is being uh, more and more widespread, uh, is, is being uh, used in more and more cardiac cath labs just because of the commercial availability. Mm -hmm. But hopefully just recognizing this and recognizing the importance of diagnosing uh, these patients with INOCA with CMD and um, and more trials that come out that show that identifying and treating these patients uh, actually improve their outcome. Hopefully will spur innovation in mm. bringing um, more competitors to the market to um, and, and more different types of wires and different types of measurements of mm -hmm. uh, things like CFR and IMR to do invasively. Yeah. Um, so those are two potential uh, directions that we can go and um, and then, of course, overall, in general, in the field, we do need to do more um, studies in both identifying uh, the patients with coronary microvascular dysfunction and mm -hmm. also testing out various therapies to help these patients. There's been a lot of headway so far, but there's still a lot, a, a lot to go in terms of uh, uh, therapies for these patients. 
And, you know, I think that was great. Thank you so much, Dr. Blair, for joining us today. And, you know, we invite everyone to go over the full manuscript with the, you know, the um, univariate, multivariate analysis and the full results of, of the of the of this analysis that's published in this issue of Jack Interventions. Thank you again, Dr. Blair. Yeah, thank you so much. It's great to be here.